Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last month, a company called SpinLaunch performed one of their first tests of their launch apparatus. SpinLaunch, as you can imagine, is going to launch spacecraft by spinning them around on a big spinny thing. This is what we call these days uh, yeeting. Yes, they are yeet launch. They are throwing this projectile at about Mach 1 using entirely electrical power. This is their small subscale demonstrator. Now this is a private corporation and they have some top tier investors behind them. The idea is not new. Well, obviously everybody's building rockets these days, but rockets, um, well rockets have a great history of putting stuff into space. They uh, have been the main way of putting things into space because there's not much else that's able to do this. Even the spin launch design still has to include a rocket in its final stage. But most of a rocket's mass is used up in the first couple of minutes, just getting it out to the edge of the atmosphere and giving it a couple of kilometers per second so that the upper stage can put the spacecraft into a circular orbit. Many engineers have noticed this inefficiency and proposed many different ways of giving the spacecraft velocity without actually carrying a huge rocket stage with them. One example is the HARP project. This is a gun which was essentially launching pro projectiles up to altitudes comparable to that of space. This isn't as simple as just having a longer gun and adding more propellant because you start to run into limits of the speed of sound in the combusting gases. But there are guns which don't use hot gases to push the projectile. Things like rail guns and coil guns, these use electromagnetic forces to accelerate a projectile down the barrel. And in theory, these can achieve much higher projectile velocities. Now, the difficulty in building these is that you have to convert a lot of stored electrical power into kinetic energy. So you need complicated capacitor banks and switching systems that can deliver this to the projectile without, say, for example, welding the projectile to the rails. That has happened and led to some particularly spectacular uh, RUDs. Spin launch instead converts electrical energy into kinetic energy slowly over time and it stores that kinetic energy in the rotating arm of the launch uh, device. So according to spin launch, they will have a 100 meter wide vacuum chamber for their launch system. In that they will have a rotating arm which will they, they will speed up to launch speed of 450 RPM. That takes a few megawatts over about an hour and a half. At the exact moment of launch they have to release their payload such that it goes straight out the launch hole and then travels onwards. Now. 450 RPM at 100 meter diameter corresponds to over two kilometers per second. So I did the math and for a 35 degree launch angle and a you know, velocity of about 2.1 kilometer per second, that puts them up at roughly the same velocity and altitude as a SpaceX Falcon 9 second stage when it performs stage separation during a return to launch site uh, type recovery. So then taking the payload up to orbital velocity from that sort of injection velocity and altitude is absolutely consistent with the kind of rocket stages we already have. And they do kindly show us what kind of rocket stage they're developing here. This is a, um, it's a two-stage rocket fueled by jet A and liquid oxygen. It uses pressure-fed engines by the looks of things. And of course, the whole thing has to be wrapped in a very secure casing that can handle the huge forces when the vehicle leaves the launch tube and hits the atmosphere going at Mach 6, Mach 7. Those were the kind of speeds that the X-15 achieved, and that had a person inside it. However, it did achieve those speeds at much higher altitude where the air was hitter, thinner. When this thing comes out of the tube, it's going to be hitting the dense sea level air, and that will be quite a violent experience. They actually give us some glorious slow motion views of this. Now, the chamber is evacuated, so they have to cover up the exit panel with a, or exit route with a panel that just disintegrates as this thing flies through it at Mach 1. But once it flies out again, if you look very carefully at this thermal view, that starts glowing because it's getting hot, right? It's getting hot because it's moving through the atmosphere at Mach 1.
An even more spectacular comparison would be the Sprint missile, which accelerated to something about Mach 10. In a few seconds, and in the lower atmosphere, its, ap its skin begins to glow white hot. Now, this would accelerate at hundreds of Gs, but that's nothing compared to these launch systems. The acceleration needed for a projectile inside a gun barrel is proportional to the velocity squared divided by the length of the barrel. Now, for a rotating system, it's practically the same. It's the velocity squared divided by the radius of the rotation. So the g-forces in both devices are pretty much comparable. The difference is that the spin launch design takes an hour and a half to spin up to speed, and during that, the g-forces on the projectile are building up slowly over time. So the design of the hardware needs to be able to handle these g-forces continuously for a long time. Now, what are the g-forces? Well... Do the math, it's a 100 meter uh, diameter chamber. They are rotating at 450 RPM. If you do the numbers, it comes out that this is about 10,000 G at peak loading. And obviously that is pretty extreme. I mean, especially if you look at our frail human bodies, those kind of G-forces would literally strip the flesh from your bones. But they've been doing the right thing. They actually have a lab set up and they're looking at hardware. They've developed reaction wheels and ion engines that can work at these kind of G-loadings. But I find it interesting that they pointed out that even unmodified smartphones and action cameras are within the tolerances needed to handle this. And that might be hard to believe if you've ever dropped your phone and broken its screen, but the screen breaks because you're putting a whole lot of force on a very small point. If you spread that amount of force over the entire device, it's not unrealistic that these things can handle that. If you think about it, in World War II, they developed shells with proximity fuses when the electronics were basically vacuum tubes. Those were fired from guns and they worked. So while they're not going to get customers that just decide to switch their satellite from a Falcon 9 to this rocket, they might well be able to get customers who are interested in the complete ecosystem, who can uh, build their satellites to the specs required in exchange for having a much cheaper launch system. They've developed, they're developing the rockets, they're developing the electronics, they've got this launch system. It's not unrealistic that this could actually work. And, you know, when I say work, I mean, obviously, you could probably make this thing work as a, an engineering project. The question is, can you make it work as a project that will make money and bring in revenues and have people pay you to launch their hardware? And, yeah, they're doing the whole thing end to end. And I'm actually quite impressed. I was really skeptical when I saw Spin Launch initially because, frankly, there's a lot of great engineering ideas about launching stuff to space without rockets and not a lot of actual practical work that gets done. So right now they have their suborbital accelerator. It's near Spaceport, New Mexico. I found it on the map. Uh, it, the chamber on that is 33 meters in diameter. And in this test, I think they spun it up to about 180 RPM, which corresponds, it puts it pretty close to the speed of sound and would put the projectile up above 10,000 meters. Now, there's some evidence that the projectile may not have been entirely stable. If they launched it in transonic region, that's not entirely surprising. They're, they could have odd aerodynamic forces kicking in. But even before they get into the air, there's technical problems that they're having to work on. First of all, they need to release this with you know, very small precision, like one millisecond to hit that very narrow exit channel. And it also has to be a release mechanism that holds something that weighs a lot. When this is spinning at about 180 RPM, as it was during the test, and they dropped it, it would be experiencing 500 Gs or thereabouts of acceleration. So it would be going from holding something that felt like thousands of tons to zero in a fraction of a second. The rotor has to be balanced during spin-up, and as soon as they release, they need to be able to rebalance the rotor so that it's not uh, you know, damaging the bearings. And again, consider that they are going to have to scale this up so that they have a 10-ton launch vehicle experiencing 10,000 Gs. That's going from holding 100,000 tons to zero within one millisecond. Building a big, you know, balanced rotating thing that rotates with that amount of angular momentum and energy, that's essentially a solved engineering problem. Changing its uh, you know, moment of inertia very quickly and... and uh, doing it safely and not destroying your system, 
that's the technical problems they're starting to solve. And it would be great if they did solve that because I would love to see a launch system which didn't require huge amounts of propellant to be consumed that generates lots of pollution. But if you look at the bigger picture, if you look at long term, this would actually be an ideal launch system for an industrial operation on the moon. Because there's, first of all, there's no air to worry about. There's no vacuum. Uh, the velocities are much lower and much more manageable. And the moon, while we have found water that could be used for propellant, it would be a lot easier if you didn't need any propellant at all. And the spin launch, this kind of process fits in there perfectly. I'm not saying we'll ever see that from this particular company, but it is sort of a big picture thing that I'm acutely aware of. So congratulations on Spin Launch for getting this first demonstration going. I hope you push the machine harder and faster and hit your uh, goals. And maybe we can actually see the full-scale one actually yeeting satellites into orbit. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.